controversial Oxford 2011. He's currently working on a manuscript that critiques conventional liberal and realist understandings of geopolitics in the context of Putin and the West in the context over Georgia and Ukraine. This book, which is called Near Abroad, will be published by Oxford University Press and will be available in early 2016. So thank you very much for uh, participating. So we'll start uh, with brief um, presentations, uh, first by Marlene and then by Gerard, followed by uh, discussion. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Constantin, for your introduction. Let me first begin by saying how much I'm grateful to the Center on Global Interest for having created these last few months in DC a really kind of new, refreshing platforms of discussion about Russia that is really kind of uh, uh, giving us new, new rooms for discussion that really are going beyond the very restrictive Cold War oriented narrative that has dominated the, the DC scene on uh, uh, discussing about Russia. Uh, as you can see from the title of the paper, this Russian world notion is really about soft power and geopolitical imagination. And what I would like to uh, show you today is that it's really a very fluid and plastic uh, uh, repertoire that Russia has been using around this uh, notion. And the blurriness or the fuzziness of the concept is really structural to it because soft power is by definition something that has to be very plastic so it can be reused in many uh, uh, different contexts. So this Russian world, world notion is in fact covering three main uh, uh, um, uh, uh, policy or, or, or elements. The first one, of course, which is probably the most uh, well-known, is that it's a way to describe Russia's policy uh, uh, in the near world. And at the moment where this soft power uh, uh, concept can also be used as a kind of hard power, when Russia uh, considers it has to move from soft to hard uh, uh, power. It's also the moment where this Russian world notion interacts very closely with the notion of Eurasia. And I will be discussing the kind of contradictory uh, uh, meaning of these two uh, uh, notions. And I can just give you an example. Uh, in 2014, Putin made that statement that Kazakhs uh, should be happy to be part and to remain part of the greater Russian world, Balshoi Ruskimir. That declaration, of course, created a lot of tensions in Kazakhstan. But the same declaration, if Putin would have said that it was good for Kazakhs to stay part of the larger Eurasian world, that would have been totally well received in Kazakhstan. So you really can see that these two notions are kind of covering uh, uh, or are used for different uh, meaning. The second notion, uh, the second concept uh, uh, that you can find inside this Russian world notion is uh, Russia's reconnecting with its old historical uh, diaspora abroad. So that's more kind of historical reconciliation uh, moment uh, for Russia with the minority, with the, the diaspora abroad, and the church has been playing a very important role in that aspect of the Russian world concept. And the third one, the third use of the, the notion is about Russia branding itself and trying to develop its own voice in the world and trying to uh, build its own image uh, in the world. And therefore, these three uh, uh, notions totally overlap with each other. And the th uh, Russian world notion is used to describe uh, 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 sometimes only one of them, sometimes two or the three of them. Let me first also begin by just giving you some element of the genesis of this concept, because I found it really very revealing. When I began working on, on that, I was really expecting to see the Russian world notion as being a kind of sub-product of the discussion about compatriots and on the uh, sub-product of Russia's policy uh, 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 about compatriots in the near abroad. And I thought it was only very recently that this Russian world notion was used as a kind of brand for Russia's vo voice in the world. And in fact, I was wrong. And that's totally the contrary. And I think that's really an important element that you need uh, uh, to remember. The term was crafted in the second half of the 90s by people walking around uh, uh, Glef Pavlovsky at that time and working for his foundation for effective policy. And that's interesting to see so that the, the first article mentioning this notion is in fact from 1997 uh, uh, and at that time the notion was used as Russia's Mir, uh, Mir and it's only in 1999 that they crafted the term uh, 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 Ruski Mir, uh, 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 Russian war. And since the very beginning of these first articles, this notion of Russian world was used really as a kind of brand 
uh, for Russia and the uh, uh, author of the paper really used kind of marketing narrative to describe that Russia needs to brand itself abroad. They use the notion of image. They make parallel with marketing uh, uh, campaign. So, but they also suddenly uh, uh, bring back a lot of kind of traditional messianic narrative about Russia's having to offer a kind of new philosophical uh, uh, meaning to the world. So that's really interesting to realize that since it bursts, this Russian world notion is really linked to this idea that Russia has a specific voice uh, uh, to give to the world. And it's only after that it has been linked to this compatriot uh, uh, issue. What I found also really fascinating is to look at the background of those designers, those who crafted this notion. They are all coming from the market, marketing world, and they are also coming, all of them, are totally passionate by Russian philosophy. They worked a lot in the 90s for in republishing several volumes about, uh, of all the big uh, name of Russian philosophy from Berdayev to Salaviev and so on. So that's a very interesting combination that you can still see today on the way the Kremlin is both kind of having both a very marketing uh, uh, strategy to brand the country itself, but also using a kind of very traditional uh, uh, messianism. In the 2000, we really see the three uh, kind of track that I mentioned uh, uh, about the use of the term of Russian world as uh, uh, Russia's policy in the near abroad, as Russia's reconnection with its historical diaspora, and as Russia's branding itself abroad. And you can see them uh, uh, developing in parallel. Uh, Putin has been using the term for the first time in 2001 when he was attending the Congress uh, 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 of the compatriots abroad. So at that time in 2001, the, the link with the compatriot narrative uh, uh, has been made. And that's interesting to see that, in fact, this compatriot term has been relatively more kind of, uh, there have been kind of hesitation between this compatriot narrative and the Russian world narrative, the Russian world being more fluid than the, the, the compatriot one. But if you read the several declarations made by uh, uh, Putin and people around him about the meaning of this Russian world or of the compatriot, you can see that it's really working by concentric circles. So the goal is really to, be, to avoid any kind of legally binding definition that would suddenly limit the room of maneuver and the room of use of the terminology. So pat compatriot or people participating, being part of the Russian world, can be Russian expatriate abroad, it can be Russian minorities in the near world, it can be Russian diaspora in the world, it can be uh, um, uh, nationalities or minorities that are unhappy in their state and that look toward uh, Russia even if they are not ethnically Russian, South Ossetian, uh, Abkhaz. It can be all the Soviet, the former Soviet uh, uh, people. It can be everybody related to the Tsarist Empire, if you look at the definition, which means that you could consider that Poland and Finland could be, cons could be part of the Russian world uh, uh, definition. And then now you can see an even more bigger extension of the use of the term that consider that everybody involved in Russian affairs, being interested by Russia or following uh, uh, or supporting Russia's policy in the world is part of this uh, Russian world notion, which means that now it's really kind of more and more linked to the idea that Russia has new bedfellows in the world, and these people are part of this uh, Russian world uh, 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 notion. Of course, Putin has been also using the term twice in 2014 to really uh, uh, describe the situation in Crimea, and in that case, his use of the Russian world notion was very much related to to the compatriot uh, uh, element. And then in parallel, we see this Russian world being more and more used in Russia's public diplomacy. And here we are back to the original uh, branding uh, uh, element. And here also the chronology is interesting because this uh, Russian world notion really is part of this general process of Russia trying to craft tools and platforms to kind of engage and interact uh, with the world. Valdai Club, 2004, 2004, Institute for Democracy and Cooperation, 2007, Public Diplomacy Foundation, 2008, Russian, uh, Russian Council on Foreign Affairs, 2010, and in 2007, so Putin decided uh, for the creation of this Russian World uh, Foundation. So it's really part of this general uh, uh, strategy. And when you look at the uh, Russian World Foundation and their uh, activities, you can see this kind of permanent hesitation between focusing only on the near abroad issues and on the Russian minorities abroad, or taking a broader, a larger view and trying to craft Russia's influence in the world and especially in Europe. 
And since this last year, this last trend of branding Russia broadly, and not only in the near road, has been the main trend uh, 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 around this Russian world notion. Uh, uh, an important element that I see as really becoming import, uh, kind of, uh, sorry, innovating element of this uh, uh, Russian world foundation is that since a few years, we have seen all these orthodox charity uh, 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 foundation often linked to uh, a very uh, uh, famous uh, uh, businessman like Vladimir Yakunin or Konstantin Malafiev becoming more and more involved in uh, uh, this uh, Russian world notion and trying to promote uh, Russia abroad. We have also seen something that was not very visible in the 2000s is that a, kind of a revival of interest from the Russian state for every kind of monument linked to Russia uh, and officially needed to be protected, so monuments to uh, fallen Russian soldiers everywhere in Europe, and so on. The, the, the recent element that we are noticing also is that the, the Russian Orthodox Church is becoming more and more involved also in using this narrative of the Russian world, but with some differences, because seen from the Moscow Patriarchate, this Russian world is in fact similar to the, uh, what they consider being the canonical territory of the Russian church. And that's relatively different because canonical <coughs> territory is a legal definition of all the churches which are subordinated uh, 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 to the Moscow Patriarchate, while the Russian world notion wants uh, uh, to remain very blurry and not being legally binding. In the last part of the paper, I try to look at how this notion has been articulating with Russia mainstream policy orientation, Eurasian Union project, the relationship to China, and Russia championing conservatism in Europe. And that's relatively interesting to see how it's not so well articulated with the two first. Uh, that's of course with this notion of Eurasian Union that this Russian world concept is the most kind of uh, uh, in competition. In fact, the articulation doesn't work uh, 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 very well. But my impression is that uh, uh, very often Russia has been uh, using this Russian world notion at the moment where the Eurasian Union project was failing. I'll give you an example. Except this statement that I, I mentioned at the beginning by Putin about Kazakhs and the greater Russian world, usually when uh, Russia is negotiating with countries that are friendly uh, to its strategy, then the narrative is about Eurasia, not about Russian world. And this Russian world narrative only emerged with countries which are relatively unfriendly or reluctant to Russia's uh, uh, integration uh, uh, strategy. It's used against Georgia, against Moldova, against, of course, the Baltic state since a long time, and now against Ukraine. While for the Central Asian state, you don't see very much this Russian narrative used because preference is given to the Eurasia one, with the exception that I mentioned of Putin's comment in 2014. With China, it's also interesting to see that this Russian world notion is not articulated at all uh, uh, um, with uh, uh, Russia's narrative uh, uh, around China. And that's interesting because Russia, you can really see uh, the Kremlin, the presidential administration, trying to develop this uh, uh, narrative that Russia is offering an alternate to the world order and to offer this uh, uh, alternate world order, Russia will partner with China to challenge the Western uh, 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 conception of the world order. And of course, China is very much needed to make it a little bit more credible in terms of economic and financial capacities. But this narrative is not articulated at all with the Russian world notion. The presidential administration don't use the same terminology doesn't use the same terminology when they are uh, discussing the relationship to China. And that's only, in fact, when Russia is, is kind of becoming this new uh, champion for conservative value in Europe that we can see an almost total overlap between the Russian world notion and this uh, 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 new conservative strategy in Europe. It's the same network, people around Mitri Ragodin and the Rodina party, the church, the orthodox businessmen, the connection with European uh, 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 far right, and here also you see how this Russian world notion is used. I can give you just a brief example on the way Russia has been able to develop this relation with the French uh, uh, National Front. In fact, it's very much linked to the Russian world notion because it stands to the role of emigre circles, Russian emigre circles in Paris, that Moscow was able to make the connection with the French far right. So this Russian world notion can be used, used both as R Russia's reconnecting with its uh, diaspora abroad, but as Russia finding new bedfellower uh, uh, travel fellows uh, 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 in Europe. 
So we see uh, uh, in this kind of new conservative uh, uh, ideology developing on Russia, we found the same kind of terminology used as the one in the one on the Russian wall, the same narrative about civilization, the same idea, that, the same concept that Russia is Europe. <coughs> Russia is the real authentic conservative Europe, while the West is a kind of uh, 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 lost or, or degenerate uh, 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 Europe. So that's really the only moment where in terms of foreign policy, this Russian world notion outside of the Russia's policy in the near world, the only moment where this Russian world notion is very much concretely connected to uh, networks of influence and of leverage. So very briefly, three, three general conclusions. The first one is that I think it's very important to, to look at the, the terminology itself, I mean Russian world, and the definition of world, the, the way the, this notion of world means <coughs> is understood uh, uh, in the Russian context, it's really this ancient meaning of uh, being part of a civilizational uh, uh, space. And it's a, a, a very interesting kind of reference to uh, the Roman Empire uh, model where you have a, a political and cultural center so with provinces around it being kind of orbiting around this political and cultural center having to demonstrate political loyalty, having to participate in cultural product uh, uh, produced by the center and being economically dependent uh, 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 on it. And I think that's really reflect this parallel with kind of ancient uh, uh, Roman Empire, make a good comparison with the way this notion of world is understood. And then you have the second term, Russia. And here I think there have been a lot of mistakes in our uh, understanding on how we see this revival of the notion of uh, Russian. As you know, in Russian you can have both Ruski and Rasiski, depending if you want to describe uh, uh, Russia, the ethnicity, lingua uh, language and culture, or Rasiski or, or Russian as the term related to state or civic identity. And in fact, if you look at the, the genesis of this concept of Russian world, you see that there is a third a, a, a way of defining Russia, and in that sense, it's a, it's a, a term Ruski that has to be used, but it's more a kind of messianic a, a definition of a, 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 um, Russian. And I really think that you have these ambiguities, you need to take into account these ambiguities that Russian world can be both something that looks more ethnic and centered on the Russian speaking minority, but it's also a kind of very messianic narrative and this uh, notion that Russia has, uh, has a specific voice. Uh, in the world. My second conclusion is that I'm not sure there is anything specific and unique to this, uh, the way Russia has been developing this concept. And if you make the comparison with Francophonia, and the Russians have been making some uh, comparison, I found them relatively similar. You have the same kind of assumption that you have a core linguistic group with French being spoken outside the, the border of the French state. This language also gives birth to a kind of culture that you want to export that is part of the, the branding of the French state abroad. It's developed in a public diplomacy where you want countries being part of this Francophonia world supporting French position and visibility in the world. It's very much linked to the colonial heritage of France uh, 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 in Africa and it has been used to justify French military intervention uh, uh, in several uh, African countries to protect its own interests or to protect the interests of its clients. So for me, if you make this comparison, this Russian world notion is not very so much specific to Russia. It's not something about the uniqueness of Russia. It's something more general about how a regional great power or regional hegemon try to develop soft power to uh, uh, give sense to uh, its actions. And then last point about the future of the term. I think the Russian world notion just in the sense of Russian minorities abroad, will be declining in the years to come, just because demographically this Russian minority in the near abroad are in a kind of long-term demographic uh, decline, and also because in some countries you see an assimilation process where it's not sure that suddenly this minority will be able to be used uh, 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 in favor of the Russian state interest. So I think the real future of the, of the term is about Russian world as a brand, as a vision of the world as a kind of cultural or civilizational space that Russia will try to brand uh, abroad. And of course, everything will depend on the ability of Russia to promote a kind of alternate narrative that would look uh, 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 credible abroad. And clearly, my impression is that now the main kind of dynamic that we see is to uh, uh, try to merge this Russian world notion with this idea that Russia is championing conservatism in Europe. And that's really where 
the, the, in fact, the, the Russian soft power has been relatively uh, efficient in only in a few years. But of course, it will depend on the ability of the Russian regime to reform, of, to offer soft power tool and not coercive tools, and also of the Russian economy to succeed, to be attractive, and to be able to fund this soft power, because when you need soft power, you need money uh, uh, to fund it. And my last point is that this Russian world notion, and I will stop on that and give the floor to uh, Jera for comments, it's really not, and I think that's really an important element, it's never used to justify Russia's autarky or retraction or withdrawal from the world. It's always used, on the contrary, as a kind of discursive pattern for Russia's dialoguing with the world, interacting uh, 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 with the world, and that's why it's so much uh, fluid, fluid and plastic, because it's, I think it's able to adapt to new contexts and new meanings. So it's a kind of permanent work in progress, and we will see in the years to come how uh, the, 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 this terminology developed and if it's able to really uh, be an efficient, long-term, sustainable uh, soft power tool for Russia, uh, both in its uh, 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 Eurasian uh, region and more globally in the world, and especially in Europe. Now we'll stop here and let maybe Chera give us some comments. Okay. Great. Um, well, I'm very pleased to be on a, a panel with Marlene, whose work is really amazing on um, thinking through Russian nationalism and Russian geopolitics, and it's been amazing for a number of years. It's really world class, some of the, the books that she has written. And um, this particular paper is terrific. I really would recommend everyone to, to read it, read it closely. And I think um, it is very useful. I found it very useful uh, in um, four different ways. First, in just conceptually. Um, how do we think about a uh, Russian world? It's something that uh, is easily securitized and uh, the subject of a certain panic uh, in, the, in the West, especially in the wake of, of Ukraine. It's a much more complicated uh, notion. It is, as she points out, it's a flexible geopolitical imagination, a floating signifier, and it's available for repurposing, which is an important point. Um, and, it, it, and this is a concept which is not unique to Russia. All geopolitical cultures have geopolitical imaginaries. And those geopolitical imaginaries are defined by, by various objects, like people, like languages, like uh, monuments, um, like churches, um, like historical legacies, and so on and so forth, and how those are instrumentalized and placed uh, and articulated by particular leaders is something that we look at and need to look at in the specific. There's no essential definition to the Russian world. It has a multiplicity of different meanings. So con conceptually, I think that's important to grasp. You have to ask each time what is precisely being articulated in this particular instance. Secondly, I think the, the, the piece is useful in terms of contextualizing where it comes from. Um, it comes out of the context of the geopolitical catastrophe, the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union, and the search for a new Russian idea, which was something that was preoccupied the Yeltsin administration, um, and it's also an attempt to try to repurpose long-standing conceits in, in uh, Russian history to, for the new particular uh, era. I like the phrase which you use from, uh, in, the, um, in the piece where you talk about Russia as eternally miscomprehended, uh, and that that is a particular condition, which of course has to do with honor and Per se, per perceptions of humiliation and so on and so forth. That in part is, is, in part is something that is very, very important. I, I think it's also important to point out, uh, and this is another useful part of the contextualization, is that it actually came out of um, a tussle with globalization. Because on the one hand, it is an attempt to kind of push back at globalization as something which is Western or American, but on the other hand, it very much is a product of globalization. It's uh, Russia as a brand. Uh, and in the 1990s, it was liberal as a notion. It wasn't necessarily associated with a revanchist project uh, at all. However, it was, that's one particular fragment that she discusses, but also the whole problematic of the compatriots, 
of the fact that the collapse of the Soviet Union was not smooth led to the creation of de facto states, uh, Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia. Uh, and how, uh, and then a very, very problematic uh, situations with the Russians in the Baltic states, and the particular condition of the Russian populations in nationalizing, uh, earnestly nationalizing states in the 1990s is one which uh, was very much part of the political agenda uh, in the 1990s in, in Russia. And uh, so the discussion of Rogozin, uh, the, the KRO, uh, that particular fragmented condition played into the, uh, the articulation of a notion uh, of uh, the Russian world. And uh, you, you then discuss how it emerges as, as a part of a toolbox of foreign policies to deal with the near abroad. Uh, and the Russian world as Russia's sphere of influence. And this is where the notion in the hands of certain groups is becoming uh, associated with something which is harder, uh, which, is, which does have a particular agenda of taking back territories or imagining what, uh, what uh, rearranged borders would look like. Um, and then lastly, I think there's a, uh, an engagement with the whole discourse of civilization. Uh, which was very important. Uh, Samuel Huntington's work was very, very influential in the United States and elsewhere. And initially there was, as you well know, in the, in the beginnings of the uh, 2000s, uh, interest in having a singular united Russia and the United States fighting against barbarism, against terrorism, and united uh, as a kind of singular civilization. But, but that broke down. Uh, for a number of reasons uh, by 2004, 2005, and uh, their civilization took on a sense of something which uh, was more about one's exceptional identity vis-a-vis -vis other particular great powers. Um, so that, that's another reason why I think that the paper is terrific. It, it, it discusses then the institutionalized, uh, inst the attempt to institutionalize this as public diplomacy, and then it places the notion in, a lar in the, kind of the context of larger geopolitical competition, global geopolitical competition. So it's not defined by the near abroad. It's actually looking at the relationship to Central Asia. It's looking at the possibility of, it, of its relationship to the Eurasian Union and the alliance against unipolarity, with the imagined alliance against uh, unipolarity with the, with the Chinese. Uh, as well as this last particular notion, which is this Russia as the counter-revolutionary power, as the uh, bastion of uh, traditional values uh, in the world today. And so in, in that sense, I think that there's a, it's very, very rich. Let me just kind of pull back from it and I talk a little bit about today's headlines in the New York Times and place this, this notion of great powers having geopolitical cultures, and those geopolitical cultures defining their relationship to their neighboring states, and then being particularly sensitive to what's happening in states which are very close to them. So in today's New York Times, we have an article about the United States seeking to reestablish relations with Cuba. And uh, we have to talk about uh, spheres of influence, not as something which is 19th century uh, behavior, but something which is very much uh, it was with us uh, uh, um, not so long ago in, in the United States, and particularly the relationship with Cuba uh, being a very, very fraught one. And that's, that is one that is not rational in lots of ways, but it, it, it's a geopolitics, this is one of the, the arguments I, I want to make in this forthcoming book, geopolitics is very much about affective dispositions towards particular places rather than hard calculations. Um, of a, the national interest. And so th that's one of, one of the articles in today's New York Times. The second one is on Moldova. And um, the title of it is, Moldova eyes Russia's embla uh, embraces flirtation with Europe fades. Uh, it's a very, very interesting article, but it essentially looks at the ways in which Moldova is this third space between the West and uh, the Russian world and uh, the degree to which it's been pulled between both. Uh, and the particular condition that it is in right now is that it's sort of swinging back, uh, disenchanted with the, uh, 
the government that's seeking to uh, take it towards Europe and towards an association agreement with the European Union. Um, let me also um, end on, on the issue which makes this very, very sensitive, and that is Ukraine. Um, so in some research that I have uh, conducted with uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. John Alokla, National Science Foundation, public opinion research in Ukraine, we did some uh, polling in December of uh, last year, and we actually asked uh, people in southeast Ukraine. We couldn't uh, uh, survey in all of the eight oblasts of southeast Ukraine, uh, so we didn't survey in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, but we did survey uh, in Odessa, uh, Odessa oh, and all that southern area up to Kharkiv. And we asked people, uh, is your oblast part of the of Ruskimir? And uh, I have the particular results here in front of me. And um, only in Kharkiv does it get close to 30%, less than 30%, agree and strongly agree. In Odessa, it's 25%. So this is a notion which has, in this area, which was imagined as Nova Russia, which has failed by and in large. Um, now, there, those are torn cities, and uh, obviously the situation is very, very fluid there. But it is worth kind of stepping back a little bit and saying that this is a particular notion which, on, on, in certain ways in the geopolitical arena, as a political technology, if you want to conceptualize it that way, is failing or has failed in, in this very, very crucial arena of Ukraine. Thanks. Thank you. So I'll ask a few questions before we begin um, Q and A. Um, to Marlene, um, it seems to me um, if the Soviet Union did anything right, um, it was to create um, a common identity uh, for many uh, diverse populations um, in the country. You know. This uh, famous, ironically, non uh, Crimean uh, pioneer Camp Tech being the, uh, the example. Do you see any attempt um, within Russia to use uh, former Soviet identity, kind of Soviet nostalgia, uh, to create this kind of Eurasian, the new Eurasian identity? Because it seems this, you know, if you talk to even younger people, everybody remembers kind of the Soviet Union as kind of this fond, um, happy, big family. Um, uh, together. Um, and to Gerard, um, what's in the Baltics? Um, how does the Russian world resonate in the Baltics? And what can the Baltic states do um, to, I guess, incorporate the Russian's population, the Russian population without them feeling like their identity uh, is being um, suppressed? And then next to, to both of you, uh, what is the interaction between, because it seems like when you talk to people about the Russian world, like people are like, uh, you know, what is this? But if you talk about Putin, immediately like, oh yeah, like, you know, he resonates as a brand, right? It's Putin who resonates um, as a brand. So what is the interaction between the Russian world and Putin brand um, um, within this Russian world? Thank you. Thanks for your question. So on the first one, I think um, the presidential administration globally has been, of course, working on this, uh, uh, trying to cultivate this nostalgia for uh, uh, the Soviet Union and the, the current memory of the, especially the late, the late uh, uh, Soviet Union, but they have been doing largely more than that. I think they really became aware that you cannot build soft power only on inertia and on memory, because generation are changing, because other influence are coming. So they have been really very much updating their cultural influence by uh, creating this powerful, uh, not only media tool, but small globally cultural product. I mean, if you look at the world, I mean, if you are now, for example, based in Central Asia, your main cultural product are still the Russian one. So the point is even not to, to look at the, to, to listen to Russia's media, it's just to participate in this kind of large Russian uh, 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 cultural product. So they have been able to re-update <coughs> an information space. I think they have been very successful in uh, updating that. And then in a sense, if you define the Russian world as those who participate in this, who are part of this, in, who are shaped by this information space, then a large part of the Soviet, former Soviet Union, especially in Central Asia, is still largely part of the Russian world in the sense that they continue to see the world mostly 
through a, a Russian eyes and analyzing the, the current geopolitical situation through the, the, the Russian prism. I think the point is that, how is that connected to this Eurasian identity? Because if you want, if when Russia really wants to create something that look like multinational and welcoming ethnic diversity, kind of post-Soviet style of uh, uh, friendship of people, then it's the Eurasian narrative that should be used and not the Russian world one. Because of course the Russian world world is too much linked not to Russia the language, because that's fine, that's everywhere in the region, but too much linked to Russian minority, Russian ethnic minorities, and especially now, given the, the current situation in Ukraine, this kind of linkage between the Russian world and uh, uh, Russia's policy toward uh, 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 ethnic minorities is becoming too much kind of sensitive. So in fact, it's this Eurasian narrative that is usually uh, 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 brought by, the, by, by Russia when it's discussing about this shared uh, uh, civilization, civilizational uh, 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 identity. The Russian world world, is that why it's so ambiguous, is that it's not so much used for, for example, Central Asia, it's much more used for Europe. Now, because of this joint conservative uh, uh, argument and the reconnection by Russia with its uh, uh, historical uh, um, diaspora. And then on the last, your last comment on Putin being a brand by himself, that's for sure. And in a sense, I mean, there have been some declaration that Putin is a protector of the Russian world, but that's declaration that have been relatively uh, made really in 2014 during the Ukrainian crisis. And I think if you look at really the way this Russian world notion has been used, uh, the media too that are uh, displayed, the kind of narrative that come, it's not very much linked to Putin as a person because his own brand is very kind of muscular the viril guy and so on. This is not really part of the Russian world notion, which is much more kind of cultural, religious. Uh, 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 so it's uh, the two brands are kind of disconnected, but of course in 2014, maybe in a sense, they, they reconnect. Well, yeah, very briefly on uh, the Baltics, I, I would put it in a larger sort of geopolitical context, and that is that you have a structural condition where you have a metropolitan power, former colonial power, uh, and then you have on its borders states which have uh, escaped from uh, empire and therefore seeking to define themselves in, in new ways uh, and often will use the, the kryptonite, which is nationalism, uh, to, um, to scapegoat uh, local uh, minorities. And that happened in Ireland. Uh, and uh, that is something that is also, I think, happened to a certain extent in the Baltic states initially, uh, but I think that there's been a moderating influence of the European Union and then NATO in trying to uh, move them towards uh, citizenship laws which are more liberal and, uh, and uh, we'll see what, what happens as a, as a consequence of, of that attempt to kind of ameliorate that um, push towards more ethnocratic uh, forms of governance. So quickly, um, do you see if there's a danger of radicalization of the concept as we've seen uh, in between discussions between this no RCL military reform or military Stokov and in kind of uh, writing things and really uh, saying negative things about Stokov, the Russian God. Do, do you see, is there a possibility of this coming back to Russia and kind of this more imperial uh, concept of the Russian world taking a hold within Russia? I think the goal of the, the Kremlin is really to try to avoid any kind of rigidification of any kind of ideological product. The, the, the presidential administration has been creating and crafting several ideological products in the 90s, and now they, they continue to fund several uh, uh, different competing ideological products because the goal is really to remain as fluid and as uh, uh, flexible and as inclusive as possible. So, they are really, I think, trying to avoid anyone capturing a, a, a narrative or trying to make it more official. And if you look at, for example, the terminology of Navarasia, you really can see how it was crafted in the early, uh, at the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis uh, between March and July, let's say 2014. And then when it suddenly becomes something that the Kremlin really was no, not really anymore in control, it could suddenly become something criticizing Putin for not being active enough in defending. Uh, uh, Russian in Zamba, then the Kremlin was able to kind of close the door of this Navarasia to retake, re to control 
uh, 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 feet and trying to uh, uh, slow down the process. So I think they have been very good in, in making several ideological projects in competition, so no one can really win, they can play with them. And then they can also be sure that if one suddenly becomes uncontrollable, then they can move forward, they can move on, on, on new uh, uh, concepts. So I think it's, it, the, the goal is really, I think, for them to avoid any kind of officialization of one narrative that it suddenly became a kind of new doctrine. And if there is something that the Kremlin is not interested in, it's having it, the real kind of new ideology in the sense of uh, uh, Marxist-Leninism, because that would mean suddenly having to really develop coercive tools or repressive tools for all those who don't want to participate in that narrative. And I think they try to be more so, to be softer and to navigate things more in a kind of soft power than hard ideological uh, arguments. Thank you. We'll open up uh, to Q&A. Uh, this room has a uh, great advantage of everybody having uh, their own microphone. So I think there's a big button. Yeah, a big green button that you can press to activate uh, the microphone. And if you could please state your uh, name and affiliation and please uh, keep your comments or uh, sorry, questions uh, to being questions. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Will Davis, a student here. Um, and so your, the Russian world is, depends on its own fluidity and not really having any bounds. But as they, as it, become, it continues to be a policy, especially with um, the elites in Russia continuing to be the same people mostly, um, won't, won't it sort of develop a pattern eventually to make it in some sense more predictable and easier to see um, and lose its um, fluidity or will they be able to continue um, to just continue evolving and kind of outpace the pattern? I guess. Thanks. Let's, let's take three at a time. Right over there, in the middle. Yeah, I'm Mark Tokola from the Economic Institute. Um, my question is, it seems very dislocating to go from the appeal of the Soviet Union, which was modern, new social order, new economic systems, international, revolutionary, to the Russian world, which is conservative, pro-nationalistic, um, anti-change, anti-progress. How does the Russian world explain what the Soviet Union used to be? Hi, Anne Daly. I just finished an Alpha Fellowship in Russia, and I was wondering, you know, we talked a lot about how the concept of Ruski Mir is perceived outside of Russia, but I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about how this concept has impacted Russians' view of themselves and their, uh, their role in the world. Um, in my conversations with Russians while I was over there, uh, there was hardly any acknowledgement of uh, any of the negative aspects of Russian imperialism or uh, industrialization in the Soviet Union and that impacting, for example, Eastern Europeans' view of Russia. Um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering if, if you have seen the project of uh, Russian world impacting modern Russians' view of themselves and their interpretation of their own history. Uh, on the first element, I think that's partly what I was uh, explaining at the beginning. I think the goal is really to, you have different elites producing different ideological uh, product, and we can more or less identify who is producing what and who is linked to which kind of, of group. I mean, the, the Rodina uh, uh, project by Mitri Rogozin and the, the main nationalist think tank in Russia now is Gorsky Club are more or less funded by the military uh, uh, industrial complex. People around Mikhail Leontiev, uh, um, the famous uh, journalist, are linked to uh, uh, Rasnev. Uh, uh, Vladimir Yakunin has his own foundation and his links to his own uh, business as the director of the uh, Russian Railways. Konstantin Malofiev and his own uh, uh, project uh, about Novorossiya are mostly linked to the telecommunication business. I mean, you can like, you have inside the inside the presidential administration, you have a plurality. It's a pluralistic world with different elite groups competing for their own assets, for their own strategy, for their own domestic influence, and they are also each of them producing different ideological products. So I think the goal for the regime is to maintain this diversity inside the presidential administration and to avoid any kind of uh, one group taking power over the other. And you can see how I am putting in play both the Eurasian Union card and the Russian World card, while in fact both could be seen as contradictory. So the goal is to avoid anyone really winning uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, over that. And I think what they have been, what we have seen since the, 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 the Ukrainian crisis is relatively the ability of the Kremlin to open the door for some new concept like Novorossiya and then to close it relatively. And it worked well. So for the moment, I think we've, the, the way the system functions make that they are still in control uh, uh, globally on this kind of balance between different uh, uh, um, um, political groups and their ideological project. On the modernity of the Russian world, I think that, I mean, at the beginning, the Russian world notion is a very liberal one. It's based on marketing values. It's, it's Russia embracing market economy. It's Russia reconnecting with its diaspora in the sense that the best of Russia was abroad. The best of Russia was Russian culture, Russian literature, Russian science abroad. So I think at the beginning, the concept was very liberal, and it was very uh, really, Russia embracing globalization, wanted to be in dialogue with the world, and I think this branding element is still very important. So I wouldn't put it in kind of contradiction with the modernizing uh, 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 narrative uh, 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 of the Soviet Union. It may seem ambiguous because you have this impression that it's really focusing on Russian ethnic minorities and so on, but I mean, it's a purely soft power tool, and what is more modern than using this kind of soft power? Uh, abroad, the same the way Russia is using this conservative agenda in Europe, the way it can come by both economic incentive, narrative against the European Union, friendship with the European uh, far right party, all of that seems to me very modern on the way great power are using their, their negotiating their, their tools and trying to avoid to go to really kind of hard power or, or military uh, uh, elements. So for me, it's not in contradiction with the, the Soviet Union modernity narrative. And on the last question about the Russian world impacting domestically, I think the majority of this, if, if we try to look at sociological survey, the majority of this ideological product, they don't really impact individually the citizens. Citizens don't really use them or participate or, 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 or buy them. But that creates a kind of global ideological atmosphere that is very powerful. And I think that's where the media, the role of the media is so important in shaping uh, 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 the, 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 the uh, kind of Russian perception of the world. So if you look individually at all these ideological products, very few people would use this Russian world notion. Very few were convinced by Navarrasia. People have doubts about the Eurasian Union because mostly you are in a very xenophobic society that is afraid of uh, a labor migration coming from Central Asia. So if you look individually, you feel like they don't make sense. Really, um, people don't really appropriate them individually. But all together, they create a general atmosphere that is very powerful. And that makes that you have a real consensus around in Russia, around the way they think the, the Russia's role in the world is, and the role of Putin and his uh, system in protecting them from, from the rest of the world. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. My name is Daniel Donald. I'm a lawyer and a, I work as a consultant in Central Asia and other parts of the farmers and so for me for the last several years. Um, you were commenting about the links, the new links between uh, this movement in Russia and the French uh, right wing. <clears throat> Maybe uh, start thinking about whether or not there's any kind of anti-Islamic undertones or any kind of fear or antipathy towards Islamic culture that's related with this movement uh, in Russia. Uh, both countries have large problems with uh, immigrants from, in the case of uh, Russia, Central Asia, and I know that there's discrimination against them there, and there's some parallels with the situation in France. Um, and I just wondered if, if, the, if there's any kind of undertone or has a concern uh, with um, Islam as part of this um, ideology. Thanks. Uh, Joseph Giorgioliani, Voice of America. Well, for countries like Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova, promises have been made that they will one day join NATO or European Union. In that sense, they have a better option other than uh, Eurasian uh, Union. So what, what options do uh, Central Asian countries have in regards to uh, economic affiliation with somebody else other than joining Eurasian Union? Thank you. Uh, Peter Toshi was the from the American Student Project. So my question is regarding uh, Russia in Asia. Uh, how would you evaluate Russia's promotion of Russia world in 
in the uh, Asia Pacific region, uh, particularly in Siberia and the Far East. And um, the second question is, when Putin invited Kim Jong-un to participate in the Victory Parade, do you think it was an attempt to integrate North Korea into the greater Russian world? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, on the first point on this kind of anti-Islamic uh, um, uh, tonality, you know, so in, in um, um, European far right, you have a kind of two big trends. One is really uh, the, 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 the most successful one in terms of electoral uh, 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 policy is really the, the anti-Islamic one, because that's the general trend of uh, uh, Islamophobia that you see everywhere in Europe. In that case, for these people, of course, what they are interested in Russia is Russia, not as a multi, very multi-ethnic country trying to build a Eurasian Union with Central Asian countries. It's Russia, the kind of last Christian white uh, 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 power. You have another smaller branch of the European uh, uh, far right, which is kind of called National Bolshevik, which really, really has a kind of more geopolitical conception uh, and less uh, identity-based uh, conception of Europe that consider that you should have this famous Paris, Berlin, Moscow axis. And in that case, these national Bolshevik groups are more or less in favor of Islam being integrated in Europe because Islam or Islamism would be for them the best kind of alternate model able to fight against US unilateralism. So European far right is divided on its relationship to Islam with this minority being pro-Islamic because radical Islam is anti-US and this ma the majority be uh, uh, Islamophobic. And that's interesting because Russia plays on both cards. They, uh, sometimes Russia play on the Eurasian Union card, on the fact that Russia has good relationship with Iran and Russia, as many Islamic countries, wants to fight against US unipolarity and so on. In that case, they speak to that part of the European far right. But in the majority of cases, and that's this new conservative agenda, is a very much kind of, it's not anti-Islamic, but it's, it's, it's really speaking to the biggest part of the European far right, which is more Islamophobic, and if you look, for example, at the end of March, there was a big uh, 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 forum organized by the Rodina party in St. Petersburg when they invited hundreds of uh, European uh, far-right uh, leaders and, and parties, and then the narrative was very much Islamophobic and centered about we need to defend uh, uh, ethnic and uh, ethnic white identity for Europe and Christianity against Islam. So Russia play on both cards because Russia itself is an ambiguous country in terms of its uh, relationship to Islam. On the Central Asian uh, uh, room of maneuver, well, that's the point is that Central Asia doesn't have the room of maneuver that many other countries have because there is no one offering an alternate uh, model. You could consider that the Chinese Silk Road project that is growing uh, 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 and now is a kind of alternate to uh, the Eurasian integration. But seen from Central Asia, it's still relatively unclear what this Chinese Silk Road project is. It's very clear that it's the best they can have economically because China is putting so much money on the table that of course it's largely more than what Russia or the West would be able to put. And therefore Central Asia welcomes this Chinese uh, investment, uh, a large investment. But that doesn't really come with any, with a very, you cannot find a really well-structured Chinese soft power that would suddenly propose a kind of long-term vision for Central Asia with what they should be. And therefore, if you put that in parallel with the, the, the fact that the majority of Central Asia are so much related to Russia because they are part of this cultural information space that you have at least 5 million Central Asians working in Russia, that Russia is still see as the, kind, the way to Europe or the best kind of European Europeanizing model for the region, then for, seen from Central Asia for the moment, this Eurasian Union integration is the only kind of regional project that they can really feel they have some future in it, even if that also creates a lot of tensions because that makes them more clients in a kind of clientelist relation uh, uh, to Moscow. While the Chinese alternative is kind of relatively unclear for the moment, and Central Asia are afraid, of course, of, of China. And there is no other models. I mean, and the US. Silk Road narrative about integrating Central Asia to South Asia and making the connection with Afghanistan, no one in Central Asia is interested in that. No one in Central Asia considers that being developing close relationship with Afghanistan can bring any good, or with Pakistan can be, bring any good in the region. So I think Russia is still, for the moment, the only one coming with this kind of civilizational project for, for Central Asia. And on the last point on Russia in Asia, 
I didn't see anything specifically related to the use of the Russian world narrative in Siberia. Uh, you have a strong narrative about the fact that the Far East is a kind of historical place for Russia, that Russia is legitimate in having a Pacific facade and playing the Asia-Pacific uh, uh, card, but it's not really developed so much. So this Russian world notion is very much targeting uh, minorities, uh, I mean Russian minorities, more on the Western side and the relationship to Europe, and it's relatively empty when it's discussing with uh, with uh, uh, Asia. And I think what you ask about North Korea, I think the same issue as with Shanghai, that you can see Russia developing a narrative that they want to put together a kind of alliance of countries who would like to uh, challenge the Western uh, world order, and therefore they can, all these people would be friends of Russia. And in that case, North Korea could be uh, uh, potentially welcome, even if I think Russia is much more interested in China than in North Korea, that is much more a problem and a burden than, than anything else. But that's not related to the Russian world itself. I mean, so for the moment, this Russian world concept has not been used really to shape this kind of alternate to the Western world order that Russia is trying to craft. Maybe it, it will emerge in the few years, but for the moment, you don't see it ideologically uh, uh, produced. I'll, I'll ask a question. Uh, to, to what extent is um, the Russian world a search for an identity, and to what extent is it simply a geopolitical tool that uh, you know they can take out? And you mentioned like the Russia, they just take it and then close it whenever um, whenever they want. No, I think it was a, it's a genuine. Uh, uh, at least at the beginning, it was really a genuine quest, but it was really part of this nineteen uh, the process, this historical process of the nineteen of kind of reconnecting with uh, 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 Russia abroad trying to close this kind of uh, Soviet time division, making the link between the white Russia and the red uh, Russia, being able to develop a new Russian identity that would be not uh, 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 kind of totally uh, humiliated, but also being proposing something positive and, and uh, 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 embracing uh, globalization. So I really believe it has this element uh, in it, but then after it depends how it is used by which kind of uh, uh, groups with which kind of agenda. And I think you may have now other kind of ideological product about Russian identity that will be coming and that will be continuing this kind of long term discussion about the place of Russia in the world. But really, if you look at how it was used, uh, the Russian world notion at the beginning was really connecting to kind of rediscovery of Russian philosophy, reprinting of all the big uh, think thinker of the uh, early to, to, um, 20th century, I think it was really part of a genuine discussion about what it means to be Russian once you don't have the Soviet Union anymore, and what can we do with this identity. So it's really part of this discussion about being a, a nation state, being an empire, how do we move from one to the other, and so on. But of course, it's, I mean, concepts don't exist kind of in an empty world. They have actors and, and, uh, and uh, uh, protectors and funders and, and uh, agendas. How, how rigid or how fluid is it um, culturally? Like I mentioned earlier, there's this you know, case about the 17-year-old Chechen woman, and all of a sudden Russians are like, well, wait, this is not like what we're, you know. Um, so, you know, how, is, is there like a, uh, a frame, a cultural framework for the Russian world? No, I think there is, there is not, except this uh, growing connection that we see now with conservative values. Okay. So that's really the only moment where you see a kind of ideological content given uh, uh, to the notion thing that, okay, if you are part of the Russian world, it means you value this kind of conservative uh, uh, um, uh, uh, morality uh, uh, element. But it's still, the connection is not totally done. So it's more, for the moment, it's really the, the main narrative is mostly you are part of the Russian world because you care about Russia. You care for Russian language, for Russian culture, or for Russia's place in the world. So it's more something very emotional. And, and Putin had a very uh, uh, clear, I mean, clear definition in its uh, uh, clearness when he said that uh, Russian world it cannot be legally binding. It has to be an individual <coughs> choice, and it's a spiritual choice. So I think they they try to maintain this kind of flexibility and, and spiritual or individual aspect and avoid any kind of hardcore ideological content. Right there. I'm Peter Ulbrich, Iris. I have a question regarding the meaning of the word mir, because it's a polysemic word, of course, uh, so it can mean 
uh, community, it can mean peace. Uh, to what degree does the peace aspect uh, play a role in the uh Mir discourse? And to what degree is there a possible global potential as an alternative to the Pax Americana, to the American world peace uh, concept? Um, is this implied? Is this potential activated at some point? Has it been? Might it be? That would be my question. Yeah, great question. In fact, it was.